Okay, we are live. It's welcome everyone. We're going to give it a minute as everybody streams on into our Wednesday Teen Science Cafe. We're going to start in just a moment. I'm going to pull up my slides. So it is exciting to have all of you here with us today. Of course, things don't work. All right. So welcome, everyone. For those of you who've been with us before, you know the drill. We are going to find the chat box. And I would love it if you can enter your name and where you're from. Uh, we like to just get a sense of who's with us today. So some familiar folks on. Hi, Eva. Hi, Sage, Oliver. Uh, oh my God, it's going so fast. You guys know this. Well, it's so exciting to see all of you. Um, if you need live streaming today, it's gonna be a moment. Our captioner has been delayed. I'm gonna put the link in, but it is not live yet um, because the captioner is not here. So, I'm here now. Oh, it's fantastic. I'm glad you got in, Diane. Diane, I'm gonna move you um, to attendee so that you don't show up on the screen. Uh, let's see. Actually, I'm just gonna hide you. Okay, I'm glad you are here. So for those of you who need the captioning, um, I had put that in the chat and you can just click on that link. So keep introducing yourselves. It's so great to see everyone where you're from. Just to remind you, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator with UVM Extension. And one of the programs that um, I put on are the V Teen Science Teen Science Exploration. I keep changing the name, but it's our Teen Science Cafes. Sometimes I think it's fun to just, you know, have a new name. But one of the things we don't change are the protocols for how we hang out here in Zoom land. So I want to remind you all that the only people that you're going to see on video are myself and our presenter. All of you um, cannot be seen and you don't have the ability to unmute yourself. So the ways that you are going to communicate with us today, we have two ways. You're gonna use the chat box and you're gonna use the Q&A box. And those are two different places and we use them differently. The chat box we use, if our presenter asks you a question, you'll respond in the chat box so you can have that back and forth conversation. Um, and if you also want to jot down any thoughts or ideas, you know, as the presentation is moving along. What we don't use the chat box for is just side conversation and being off topic. That can tend to create a distraction. And so we just want to make sure we, we don't do anything that's going to distract from the presentation today. The Q&A box is specifically for the questions you have for our presenter. And so you can put a question in and, and be specific because you might have a question about a particular slide, but it might be 10 slides later before we get to that question. So make sure your question is, is specific enough that we know what you're referring to. We do make sure that we answer all questions before we uh, end our session today. Um, one of the cool things about the Q&A box is you can put in your question anonymously. Um, and so if you don't want to put your name to a question, although I encourage you to do that, um, you can always put the question in anonymously. The other thing about the Q&A box, you can upvote a question. So if someone wrote a question that you liked, or maybe it was a question you had, there's a thumbs up button. And if you click on that, it actually moves the question up the rankings. But again, we answer every question, so it doesn't matter if your question is first or last, we make sure to answer it. So why we're here um, today, we just ask that you're courteous and respectful to one another and just stay engaged, participate fully. Um, if you need to leave early, you know, you can just log out, but we hope that you'll stick with us to the very end. So before we get to today's presentation, I just wanna let you know about um, a lot of the other opportunities that we have going on this fall through UVM Extension with the 4-H programs. So the Science Exploration is a series of different science cafes. So every Wednesday at 3.30, we have a different topic. You can go to the website listed below to see the listing. 
Um, next week's topic is on living robots. So I encourage you guys, you have to sign up each and every week because your Zoom link is unique to that cafe and to your email. So I understand it can be kind of a pain sometimes to have to type your information in over and over again, but it's the best way that we can um, run our registration. So I'm glad that you guys uh, go ahead and do that. We also have a program starting um, next month called 4-H World Changers, where it's you're going to learn how to code and create a website. But the cool thing about this one is we're doing it in partnership with Ohio 4-H. And so we're trying to bring young people together from Vermont and Ohio. And, and honestly, it doesn't matter what state you're from, you can participate. Um, and so that's going to be a six-week session on Thursday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. We also have a Youth Environmental Summit coming up. Um, that's going to be an asynchronous learning experience. So you can sign up and then over a period of three weeks, you can log in whenever it's convenient to you to participate in workshops. Um, and we're building it so there's going to be a lot of um, opportunities to share your ideas, um, give responses to workshops, and really kind of create a community of people who are really interested in environmental issues and taking action on that. And then related, there's a program called Try for the Environment, where we train teens to be environmental teachers, where you're, you have the opportunity to teach environmental lessons to younger youth. So you can learn about all these programs in a lot more, because there's way more programs than these four at the email listed on this slide. So now I want to move on into today's presentation. Um, our cafe topic is Sharky Science, studying populations of sharks and rays around the world. And our presenter today is Dr. Easton White. He is a biologist at the University of Vermont, and he has studied the ocean in many places, including Costa Rica and the Bahamas. His latest work focuses on coral reef fisheries in Madagascar. And his work also involves mathematical modeling and computer programming to understand how pop populations of marine animals change over time. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. White with us today and uh, look forward to learning about your work. Great. Thanks so much, Lauren, for the introduction and also inviting me to, to come give this talk. It's really a joy to come chat with everyone and see people from all over the country tuning in to, to, to hear about this. So it's very encouraging to ask lots of questions throughout. I'll ask some questions of you as well, and we'll chat about those. So feel free to chime in during the chat. Um, and also just chiming in um, with the, the questions at the end as well. So we'll get to all those too. And so today, I'm going to talk to you a lot about um, how we do science in the ocean kind of generally with some focus on sharks and rays. And I'll talk a lot about the different tools we use to try to understand them. So that's why I have on this front first slide, I have a picture of me and some other colleagues doing some work on sharks. So that's a shark in the water um, next to the boat. Then I have a picture of a bunch of math equations, which you don't have to worry about the details, but just it kind of shows these two parts of my life as a scientist, the two main tools that I use. And, but I'll talk a lot, a lot about other tools as well. So when you think about the ocean, there's a ton of magnificent creatures inside it. And so here's just some of my favorite species of just sharks and rays. And so there's just one group of species in the ocean. Um, and so it's incredibly diverse. And so you have everything from the whale shark right here in the middle, which is the largest fish to ever live um, um, on the planet. Um, and then you have all kinds of other, other things like you have um, these um, stingrays as well that are basically these flat sharks. So you see those on the bottom. You have up in the top left here, you have scalped hammerhead shark, which is a very iconic species because of its um, very kind of funky, weird head. Uh, top right, you have the tiger shark. And all these are, again, these vary tremendously in um, how they live their lives, the size of these, in the, uh, these creatures, um, how many offspring they have. They, they vary quite a bit. And so we have all this diversity, which is really interesting to look at. Um, and then we can think about um, what do we know about sharks and rays? And so the first question I'm going to ask is actually going to be a poll question. And so just getting at the idea of um, how many species do you think there are of sharks and rays, of all these species of sharks and rays in the globe? 
So. All right, so I'm gonna launch a poll right now and hopefully you will be able to put your answer into the poll. If for some reason you don't see the poll, then use the chat box. So I see some of you already use the chat box, but go ahead and use the poll um, just so we can get a better sense on what you all think. We'll wait for a few more people to respond. But it does look like C seems to be the leading contender. What do you think? How'd they do? Yes, pretty good. So yeah, C and D were the kind of the closest two answers. And so, um, yeah, so there's 1,134 species, more or less. We're always finding new species. Um, this includes all sharks and rays. So um, everything part of what we call their lasmobranch family, which you don't have to worry about that word, but of all those different species on the entire globe. They live in many different parts of the globe, just over a thousand. Um, and so there's all kinds of different ones. So I showed you some of the ones that I'm more, most familiar with, but there's all kinds of also very weird sharks and rays. So this is a goblin shark, um, which is known for uh, living in pretty deep water often. And it has this really strange looking kind of snout on top um, of its head. And that's how it uses, uses that to try to detect prey. So again, just kind of highlighting the huge diversity of sharks and rays, in particular, it gives kind of the, maybe some of the, the more interesting or strange ones. Um, one of my favorites is the cookie cutter shark. And so these are the tiny little sharks, um, but they have these, if you can see here in this picture, um, even though they're really small, they have this really crazy um, jaw that basically is able to take these little golf ball or cookie cutter, uh, cookie sized chunks out of things. And it'll swim up to things like other sharks. Um, you can see in this photo, this other, shark that has this chunk out of it, but it'll swim up to other sharks or whales and dolphins and just take little chunks. And that's all it needs to, to survive. Um, and then it can kind of run away very, very quickly. Uh, but that's how it lives its entire lifestyle, right? And so these are very different types of species from one another, but they're all part of the sharks and ray families. So another poll question for everyone, what percent of species are endangered or threatened? So just around the whole globe, what, what do we think? All right, so poll two is launched. What do you think? What percent of species are endangered or threatened? And again, if for some reason you don't see the poll, you can put your answer in the chat box. All right, we got a bunch in the chat who are agreeing with the majority in the poll. It looks like the majority is saying D. Cool. Oops. Yeah, so D is correct, so about 20%. This is a number that obviously changes over time when there's new threats or maybe species we cover a bit, but about 20% is what we know right now. Um, and so if we break this into, we look at this plot, uh, this data, there's a whole lot going on here, so don't worry about all of this. Just know that there's a, this is kind of breaking it down by different groups of species. And the one that we're going to talk about are the sharks, rays, and chimeras, which are just a, another um, very similarly related species um, of deep water fish. Um, basically, they're all categorized by the fact that they don't have any bones, they just have cartilage. So like the same stuff that's like in your ear and your nose, that's what these, these species have in common. And so if you look at this, um, in the red here, that would be critically endangered, um, where the orange would be just be endangered, the yellow is vulnerable, um, and the green over the right, that's where species that we're not really concerned about. So that's how we get this number, about 20% of species um, are threatened or vulnerable um, in some ways. And this varies, obviously, if you compare that to other species like uh, mammals right above it, or look at Amphibians, it varies quite a bit for different groups, but that's what we know for sharks and rays. But what's really intriguing here, yeah, exactly. So what does the gray mean? So the gray is the species that are data deficient. So we actually know, we don't know how to categorize about 35% of all species. So that's over 300 species of sharks and rays that we don't know a lot about at all, that we, we don't know if they're threatened. We don't know if they're doing really well. We might not know a lot about where they are or how many births you know, often they have per year. We just don't know a lot about those species. And so there's a huge amount of information that we just don't know that we need more research for. 
So then the question is, how do we learn more about sharks and rays? So we don't know a lot about a lot of species, but how do we actually learn more about them so we can either understand them better scientifically, but also think about their conservation status? Oops. So if people want to just chime in in the chat, just talk about um, any ideas for any tools that we as biologists might use to study sharks and rays. What tools might be really helpful? Boats, submarines, mm -hmm. GPS thing for, sh for the sharks, cool. cameras, oxygen tanks, scuba gear, uh, behavioral observations and satellites, tracking, tr chum, camera. You guys have some good ideas. Oh, we'll give you a few more seconds, yeah. Yeah, there's always a delay on the typing. So underwater cameras and sensors, cameras and underwater robots, studying them, shark cages. Cool, feel free to keep chiming in, but I want to show one picture um, that I think summarizes some of this uh, somewhat well of kind of how different people view what a marine biologist, which is um, what I would call myself as someone who studies the marine systems, kind of how people view marine biologists. And so I think a lot of people think I just hang around and play with dolphins all day. Um, I think some people might think I do a lot of activist things and um, trying to promote something, which is, you know, is also great, but it's not exactly what a marine biologist might do. Um, my friends just think I hang out at the pool all day, like by some tropical ocean, that's fine. Uh, my students just think I lead this like big submarine team, uh, which would be super cool, but that's also not what I do all the time. I think I like spend all my life swimming around the ocean, looking at cool things. Um, but in reality, what I do is a lot of this. So I'm at my computer a lot, like I am right now. And I'm trying to look at data and gather information to try to figure out what is happening with the different species I might be studying. And so I think there's a lot of like this like public perception of what a marine biologist is versus what we might actually do or what we might do with most of our time. Oops, yep, so we just did that. So talking about just some of the ways we go ahead and study species, uh, one of the first ones that a lot of people mentioned is field work. And so things about going into the actual ocean, this could be using boats or submarines or on shore and trying to gather information about species that we study. And so you can imagine it depends a lot on what species you're looking at. For sharks and rays, what we often want to do is we want to catch that species very carefully. And then we might want to take measurements of them. So you can see here this picture in the middle, someone's taking a measurement of the shark while it's on this boat. Um, you can see here on the right hand side, I'm going to mention GPS tags. And this is one way we can put these tags actually inside the sharks um, and we can track where they go. And so they swim around with these tags. And if you look here in the bottom right, you can see that there's a shark swimming next to that kind of black, like what looks like a water bottle. That's a, 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 a underwater receiver that can pick up if a shark swims by it or not, if it has one of those tags. So this is a big part of what marine biologists do, but it's really not all they do. Um, and so, yeah, we can go out there, we can take samples, maybe DNA samples, um, measurements and things. I mean, this is just a small part of what a marine biologist does. So you get all this data information and information, but then you have to go do something with it, right? If you actually want to answer some scientific questions. So with that kind of information, we can also do a lot of mapping. So this is a big part of what a lot of biologists do. Is they take the information, that, like this GPS information, like you would have um, on your phone that direct you, you know, place to place, for example. We can put the same kind of GPS tags on sharks and track their movement. So this is some work we did off of Florida. We put these tags on lemon sharks, which is just a, a species of shark. And when we tagged them, we basically found out after tagging dozens and dozens of these animals, that we could track their movement up and down the coast. And so they had this yearly migration that they would move up and down depending on how cold and warm the water was. So in the winter months, they would move down the Florida. So they're basically snowbirds, right? Like people who move down the Florida when it's really cold. Uh, and then the other seasons, the seasons, they might move north. We saw this, yeah, all the way up, not just in Florida, but all the way actually up, up to the Carolinas. So 
So they move quite a bit all the way across uh, Florida and the Carolinas. And all that is gathered by the same type of technology that is in your phone, uh, just a simple GPS technology. We have to make it waterproof because you, know, you can't just attach a phone to the shark. Um, but we attach these special satellite tags and then we get information about them. Yep, and so this is the tag that we're using here. So uh, in the top right, you can see that we've basically taken, there's a little antenna sticking out of this um, shark fin, and that's the GPS ping that's gonna come out. And you can see that we're actually attaching it to the fin of the shark. And so you don't have to worry about this hurting the shark in any way. It's kind of like getting your ear pierced. Again, it's just cartilage. And so we um, cut a couple of holes in there, and then we attach that GPS tag actually to the shark itself. And that's how we get all this really cool information about where the sharks are moving. So another big part of things that I didn't show yet is laboratory analysis. And so what I showed earlier, we were taking all those measurements of these different sharks. We can also take things like um, maybe a piece of skin, like a little clip of not their ear, but of their fin, or maybe a blood sample. And we can get some really cool information like doing DNA analyses. And DNA analyses are a really cool way that we can start tracking um, uh, who's giving birth to who. So who's mating with each other? And then we can say, okay, well, we caught this one baby shark. Who's, whose parent is it? And we can actually go find whose parent it is using DNA. Just like if you've ever done like a 23andMe a DNA test for people, you can do the same things basically with sharks. Um, but there's a lot of other laboratory work we might do. So we might collect water samples, for example. I mean, you might be looking at maybe the effects of pollution on a different on a certain species. And so you might collect the water sample in the field. And so that's one small component that's collecting that water sample. But then you have to do it, bring it into the lab and do a bunch of analyses to try to figure out what pollutants are in there, what um, the makeup might be in there um, of just the, what's in the water. Um, and then lastly, there's not a good picture of it here, but there's behavioral studies where we can actually bring sharks into a tank or like in an aquarium and we can watch them and do these behavioral observations that might be really hard to do in the field because it just might take too much time where you might only have so much time to use for scuba, for example. Um, another thing that's becoming more and more possible is using data from space. And so someone had mentioned satellites earlier. And this is exactly um, the types of things we can get. And so right here, this is a picture um, basically using satellite um, data um, of all the fishing vessels fishing around the US this year, right? And so it's a remarkable way where you could imagine if you were wanting to get this information on the ground, you'd have to go to all these different places and like track where these boats were going and that might not be feasible. So what we can do is we can use either satellite data, uh, getting like GPS data, or we can actually use satellite images to try to figure out what's happening and you can get really useful information like figuring out Oh yeah, well, there's a lot of fishing in the Gulf of Mexico, like off of Louisiana, but then there's a lot in the Northeast, so like in the Maine, for example. There's also a lot on the West Coast up near Washington and British Columbia, Canada as well. And you can start getting this really cool information, and then you can take the same information and overlap it with our GPS information about sharks to try to understand, well, how does fishing interact with sharks, for example? That's the kind of power you can do with this kind of analysis. So the last thing I'll talk about um, as, a, as just another tool we can use, and I'll, I'll get into this more later, is we can use mathematics and computers, and computer programming in particular, and we can build these mathematical models, and I'll, I'll describe this more later, um, of the ocean to try to understand it better. And so this can be something just on your laptop. So like right here on the right, someone's writing some code, and you can try to build models just on the laptop. But sometimes the models get really, really complicated. And you actually have to use big, giant supercomputers, which is what's here on the left-hand side. And that's how you model the ocean. And that could be modeling populations, but it can be also be modeling things like um, how do currents change in the ocean. And so you can imagine it, it takes a lot of computing power to figure out how does all the water move on the entire planet. It's a really tough problem, but people have to try to understand that so you can predict things like hurricanes, for example. When are hurricanes coming? Where are they going? And we use these types of models, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. So, 
before I go farther, farther, I just want to talk a little bit about my background. And so uh, I'm in Vermont now. It's a landlocked state. There's a great Lake Champlain, but there's no sharks and rays in that, unfortunately. Um, and I actually grew up in landlocked Arizona. So this is uh, what it looked like for me. I didn't actually live like that much in the desert. Like I actually, I had a house, right? Like we had a house that we lived in. But we grew up in landlocked Arizona, so there's no ocean. Um, my father worked in construction. My mom was a homemaker. Um, and I grew up visiting the ocean. And I even at one point had a job at a zoo. And that kind of introduced me a little bit to what it was like to work with animals and some ideas of science. But I was not a particularly great student. And so it really wasn't until college that I started trying to understand um, what was science and what it, what, it, what it meant to be a scientist. And I started kind of developing my interest in being an ocean scientist and also in doing some other work um, with mathematics as well. So just real quickly, this is kind of my path. I, like I said, I didn't start, uh, I was living in Arizona, so I wasn't near the ocean. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time actually working on a very non uh, ocean creature uh, in the left hand side here under Arizona State University. There's this little creature, looks kind of like a hamster maybe or a rabbit. It's called a pika. They live up in the, yeah, there you go. Um, it lives up in the mountains um, on the West Coast. So there's none here on the East Coast, unfortunately. It was up high in the mountains. Um, and I had a professor who was studying them and I asked if I could get involved and work with them. I didn't really care what species I wanted to work, that I could work with, but I wanted to work with some animals. Um, and in that case, the tool that we used was mathematics. So we used mathematics to try to understand what was happening with that population. So we wanted to, to predict forward into the future, what would happen with pikas. In order to predict, predict forward, you have to build some kind of model to try to predict forward, just like you would the weather or something. You wanna use a model to predict forward. And so that was really my first exposure to trying to understand how mathematics could be used to understand something about an animal species. So then I was really fortunate after that to kind of use my programming and mathematics skills to actually live and work in the, the Bahamas in Florida for a while. And so there I was doing, that's kind of was my real introduction to shark and stingray research. And so here you can see me, we had just caught a shark recently. We we're gonna take some measurements and do some DNA analysis and some other things. But that was a lot of my work for a couple of years there, uh, spending a lot of time in the field. And eventually, that was really cool and fun, uh, but I wanted to do more of the science side of things and I wanted to say, okay, well, what questions are still unknown about sharks and rays and what can I answer about them? And so I bounced around a little bit between British Columbia, Canada uh, and UC Davis, uh, University of California, Davis, so in California, that's where I actually did my PhD. And there I, I just show on the top here, there's a bunch of computers and there's me teaching, just kind of showing that's where I developed my love for teaching. And so a big part of my job now is not only doing science, but also teaching. Um, during this time as well, I continued to do some of the mathematics work I had been talking about. And I was getting more and more, not just thinking about sharks and stingrays, but thinking about fisheries and how people interact with the ocean generally. And so really sharks and rays um, just being one part of that. So I wanna, wanna talk about one particular study that I think illustrates a lot of these different ways and how we ways in which we study the ocean. And so um, during college, I was really lucky to be able to live and work in this place called Bimini Bahamas. And so it was a really interesting place. Um, oops. Um, this, in the Bimini Bahamas that um, I live, basically there's two islands here. There's South and North Bimini. I lived on the South Island. And there's been a lot of different people over the last 30 years have gone to this area and studied in particular lemon sharks. So um, I'll show, you can see this picture right here that there's very, very small lemon sharks. So it's about maybe just less than like two or three feet. So there's less than a meter. And so what we were doing is we were catching these, these sharks, putting tags on them, then tracking their growth over time. So we'd see if they grow, we'd see if they move around. Um, and that had been done for over 30 years at this point. So it's a remarkable population because it's been studied for so long and so intensely. So again, how do we study these sharks? So we, we go out there on our little boats and we catch these sharks using these nets. So then we would take and put various tags on them. We'd measure them, we'd do DNA samples, take water samples, we'd track their movements. So we did all those different things is what we do out there. 
we mostly worked with the juveniles because those are the ones that lived in the uh, in that little lagoon area that I showed on the last slide. And then the adults eventually, um, as they grow up, the adults leave, and then they come back years later to actually give birth. So they're kind of like salmon, where they um, leave for a while and they come back to wherever they were born. So that's a lot of our day-to-day -day work was going out there and catching these sharks and trying to understand a little bit more about them. So here's just one clip. So I talked about tracking their actual movement. And so if we look at this clip, we're just to kind of set it up a little bit, we have the shark. And the shark is flipped upside down. And so one really neat feature about sharks and some other species is that if you flip them upside down, they go into what's called tonic immobility. Very fancy word for basically meaning they go to sleep. And so you turn them upside down, they kind of go to sleep. Um, they still move around and they're still breathing and everything like, like that, like breathing in water. Um, and so they're just hanging out. But what that allowed us to do is that we could flip them over and then we could do surgery on them to put a tag inside their body. And that way we could track their movement. So I'm gonna play this clip here. See, so making a small little cut in the abdomen. Shark's gonna move just a little bit. You know, it's just kind of getting poked a little bit as it's you know sleeping, right? And so putting this big tag in there. Oh, so the shark shark woke up a little bit. So we have to like wait, pause, and then finish putting that tag in there. And then we can put a couple sutures just to kind of stitch up that shark. So the same thing you would do on a person. Um, you don't usually put tags in people, but th same thing, same kind of surgery, same types of tools that you put these sutures into the shark. And eventually we'll finish up with all those stitches. Turn the shark over, and the shark will swim away, totally fine. So just, just a, a, a sleep long enough for us to do that surgery. Oops. So what you can get from this information is you can do all this work over this, these decades of time, and you can understand what's happening with the population at large. So we can see here back in the 1990s, the population was around maybe 60 individuals. And it's moved up and down since then because some individuals are born, some might die, some might move away. Um, and through our tracking, you can track how they change over time. And you can see that it's actually kind of flat over time, that it's not going extinct, this population. Um, it's not increasing a whole lot, but it's just kind of staying the same, which is encouraging that it doesn't seem to be that threatened with uh, things like fishing, for example. But in addition to the population numbers, you can also get a lot of cool information about sharks. So we know, for example, from DNA analyses that they have about six uh, pups, so that's what we call baby sharks. So six pups per individual female. Um, so that's how, how much they reproduce. We know that females, they only reproduce every two years. So again, they leave the lagoon area once they're big enough. They hang out, they go eat and, and things, come back every two years and reproduce. Um, we also know things like the juvenile mortality rate is between 0.38, 38%, and 65%. So that's how many juveniles sharks will die each year of a combination of natural causes, including being eaten by larger predators, but could also include fishing or things, destruction to the habitat, for example. But even though we've been studying this population for decades, we had no idea what the mortality was like for adult sharks. So we didn't know how many adult sharks survive year to year? And that's really important because if a lot of adult sharks are dying, then that might cause concern for what the population is doing overall. Is it going extinct, for example? So we, we didn't know what that answer, and we wanted to figure it out. So that's where my work using mathematical, mathematical models previously on things like pikas became really important. And so you can think of a mathematical model kind of as a video game. And so you can think of it as uh, a video game in the sense that a video game is not real life, but it's kind of a simulation of real life. And what you can do, it could be for something like Fortnite, right? So it could be any game you could think of. And you'd say, okay, well, uh, we can't look at nature specifically. Like I can't look at, um, I can never do the experiment to figure out, well, how many sharks are dying one year or the next? But what I can do is I can play with these video games of basically the ocean to say, well, what happens if the mortality rate of sharks goes up? Will that cause extinction or will it not cause extinction? Um, and so what we do is we collect all the information we know about sharks. So when they're born, 
um, when they get counted in the field, the census, we know that sharks die at some rate. Um, we know that females come back to reproduce. We take all the information that we know about this population of sharks, we put it into what is basically a video game, but for sharks in the ocean. And we use that, do that by using a lot of programming, like computer programming, um, and mathematics as well. Yeah, so yeah, we turn this information into mathematical equations. And as I was kind of alluding to earlier, we take these mathematical models and then we can run experiments with this model just like you would in a video game. So in a video game, you might say, well, what happens if I open that door? Or what happens if I go to that new city in this game or something? And what you can do with a mathematical model, you can think about, okay, well, what happens to the population if I pretend that there's a lot of fishing? Well, if I pretend there's climate change? So uh, we kind of say, like, what is the effect of climate change if we turn it on or off in the mathematical model? We know it's happening in nature, but what is it, its effect in the model? So you have all these different pathways that you can choose in this mathematical model, like what's the effect of protection, or what happens if, you, if the sharks lost some of their habitat? What would happen then? And you can kind of start looking at all the possibilities, uh, just like you would in a video game, of figuring out what happens if you do this or that, or this or that. And you can start playing these experiments in the, in the game itself. So using this mathematical, mathematical model, we discovered that adult sharks, they about 18% of them die per year. Um, and so that was a new thing that no one had ever figured out before. It was just kind of understanding, yeah, about 18, maybe 20% of, of the sharks die each year from just natural causes. Um, also, that could include fishing or something as well. So that's really good to know what kind of baseline there is for sharks for this particular population. Um, but what's really cool, as I talked about, you can play these experiments with these um, these um, video games of sharks, essentially. And we looked at, well, what would be the effect, just if we just pretending for a second, what happens if we increase the amount of fishing on sharks? And we discovered that even a slight amount of fishing pressure uh, on adult sharks in the Bahamas could lead to that population being threatened with extinction, in that case, so for that particular population. And so it was really helpful. There's no way you could do that experiment in nature, right? Like we couldn't just have, you know, one Bahamas here and one Bahamas here and say, well, let's fish sharks here and not fish sharks here. You can't really do that experiment in real life. So we can, again, we can use these mathematical models to play these experiments that you might not ever be able to do in real life. So just to summarize a few points that we talked about today, kind of before we jump into some of the, the Q&A, um, is that some shark species of sharks and rays are endangered or at least threatened. Um, but we really don't know a lot about many species in the world's oceans. So like I talked about earlier, there's about 35% of all species for sharks and rays that we don't know very much at all about. And that's also true for a lot of other species, whether that be mammals or frogs or whatever, there's a lot we don't know. and We need to do more work about them, with them. And in particular for thinking about sharks and rays, but also for other species, um, there's a lot of different tools we can use. So this could be field work, it could be mapping, so mapping with all the data we collect from the field, laboratory analyses, satellites, mathematics, including you know, computer programming. Those are all the types of tools that we can use, um, in particular as marine biologists, to answer the types of questions that are really important, not only scientifically, but also thinking about conservation. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions. That's great. So before we get to the questions, I want to just launch one more poll. Yep. We always just get a little bit of feedback before we go into the questions. So you guys, I put the poll up. There's two questions. Um, and I know we're going to be getting to some questions. So uh, you're still going to get to learn some more. Um, but I like to do this because I know some of you don't stick around for all of the questions. So just take a minute, do this, and then we'll get right into the questions. I see that a bunch of you have posted some already. And also feel free to start adding, if you still have other questions that aren't in the Q&A, go ahead and put those in, but after you take the poll. <laughs> I'm gonna give it about another 30 seconds if you guys can just get your responses into the poll. 
appreciate it very much. And again, if you want to add a question to the Q&A, go ahead and do that. We'll be moving into there. All right, I'm going to close the poll right now. So thank you all for doing that. And let's go into our first question for Dr. White. So Eliza wants to know, does the GPS in the fin affect their swimming at all? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. So people have done a lot of work on this to try to figure out, like basically looking at sharks behavior for those that have the tags or not. And we actually use the same tags for turtles and other things as well, and other species. Um, and it, it, it looks like it doesn't have much of an effect. And so that's one really good thing is you have to design these tags in such a way so it doesn't affect their swimming or their mating behavior or anything else. But yeah, great question. And Cole G would like to know, what are your thoughts on the seagrass eating shark? Um, I don't know. What, what is the seagrass eating shark? That sounds super cool, but I actually <laughs> don't know what that is. So it sounds like some shark that might be, you know, a bit of a herbivore um, or vegetarian shark, but I, I don't know. Nicole, if you want to add any um, additional information in the chat to help us with that question, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but while we're waiting on that, the next question, how do you build a model of the ocean if we haven't even discovered it all? Wow, that's a great question. Mm. So yeah, so thinking about, I talked about, we gather all this information to build these models, but you can't know everything. And so sometimes what we have to do is we have to assume certain things. So for example, if we don't know maybe um, you know, the birth rate exactly of a, of a shark, we might have to kind of take our best guess and see how that works. But then that kind of promotes like the next line of research of like, well, we need to answer that question to make these mo mathematical models better as well. So it's kind of this back and forth of making assumptions sometimes if you don't know something and then uh, moving uh, forward um, with additional research to try to figure that out. So it's a constant struggle. It's a good question. And Cole has written in the chat to clarify his question. He said, bonnethead sharks have been found hmm. with large amounts of seagrass in their stomach. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, I haven't read about that. So I'll have to read more about that, but that sounds super cool. Thanks, okay. Cole. Thank you, Cole. Um, our next question, if you, if you cannot physically get in the water, what kind of robots do you use and what would you use them for? Yeah, it's a good question. So I spend very little of my time now in the water. So like I've done some field work where I was out in the water doing things, but it's not an essential part of marine, marine biology. So you don't have to go to the ocean, don't have to scuba dive, you don't have to be in the water. And so there's a lot of different robots people might use as well to help with that. So when I talk about satellite data can actually give us some information, but also drones are becoming more and more popular. And so you can fly drones right above the water and you can use the video from those drones to look for sharks or whales or other species, kind of larger species. And you can fly that drone around to kind of look for what's going on. And so you can have drones that fly or you can have underwater drones that are also trying to um, look for individual species, for example. Yeah, a lot of different tools. Wow. Uh, Nate has a question here about how deep does marine biology dive into mathematics? Yeah, it's a good question. So for me, it dives really deep in the mathematics. But I think that kind of also shows um, if you look at the field of marine biologists, their backgrounds vary a lot. And so um, if people who study marine biology will get some kind of degree probably in biology, not necessarily in marine biology, but they're probably going to also get some other skills. So they might have some skills, let's say laboratory analyses, or my skill was in mathematics and computer programming. And then you use all those skills to try to answer your questions. Um, so it can dive really deep into the mathematics, but it's not an essential piece of it. So it's just one, one tool that you can use to try to understand what's happening. And I'll add to that, I had a friend who studied marine biology that was his undergraduate degree and then eventually went on to be an underwater archeologist. Oh, cool. Which was very cool, right here in Lake Champlain with the, uh, the shipwrecks from the Revolutionary War. Very cool. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I should uh, mention as well, sorry, that I, I don't have a marine biology degree. So I have a biology degree and a minor in mathematics, um, but I, all my marine knowledge was stuff that I picked up in classes or in the field, but I don't have a formal degree in marine biology, but I'm still a marine biologist, so. Cool. Yeah. 
Uh, is it the DNA makeup of a shark similar to ours? Yeah, so it, it kind of depends. So it's um, yes is the short answer, um, meaning that um, it's not as similar as like a chimpanzee and us, but it's more similar than us and a lot of other species. So us compared to trees, for example. Um, but we're um, on the same branch, if you will, um, that we both um, have backbones um, and we both um, are uh, vertebrates, we have teeth. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between humans and sharks, but they're closely related in some ways, but also are distant cousins in other ways. So, so you just mentioned the backbone. Mm. Our next question says, do sharks have cartilage in the same spots as other fish? Like, do they have a backbone out of cartilage? Yeah, exactly right. So yeah, you're totally right with the question that they, um, all the kind of the traditional bones you would think of, like a backbone or jaws or things, those are all coming up from cartilage. Um, and you might have different cartilage that's a lot harder than other cartilage, for example. But yeah, so you're kind of replacing all the, the hard bone with, with cartilage. Uh, Eva would like to know what oceans have a greater population of sharks? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so certainly looking at um, maybe not which oceans, if I can rephrase the question, but just um, around tropical areas tend to have a lot of shark species. So you have shark species all the way to the North and South Poles as well, but a lot of the species are, are, are centered in the tropics, the really warm areas of the ocean. You know, places like the Caribbean, um, one of the hot spots that I've worked at is off of Costa Rica. Um, so like Costa Rica, um, like near um, Cocos Island or Galapagos Islands as well. There's a lot of species for there, for example. And then there's a whole lot of species in Southeast Asia and Australia, the whole other uh, big area for species of sharks. Um, who did the first research on cookie cutter sharks? Um, I don't know. Um, there's actually not really a lot known about cookie cutter sharks because they're kind of this mysterious um, species and I, I don't know who first started studying them, um, but we need a lot more work on them. We don't actually even have very many pictures of them or very many samples of them. Um, they're just hard to find and hard to study. So um, yeah, I'm not sure, but there's a lot more to do. Uh, Greta wants to know when they are upside down um, in the sleep trance, do they feel any of the surgery? So it's hard. So we can't ask the sharks, right? Like if they <laughs> felt something, right? That would be great. Um, we can certainly see that like, yeah, maybe if they're having the surgery, they get woken up or something. Um, but it's um, the same kind of thing as if you had like anesthesia or something that it puts, in, it, it puts you to sleep. And so they really shouldn't feel much at all. But if they got woken up or something, they might start feeling something. But um, yeah, so it's a good question. But as far as we know, we don't think they feel much. That, and that's why they kind of sit there very calmly and patiently while we do the surgery. So related, Elliot wants to know, where does the tag go? Like, how do you determine that's the spot to put it like, and not like hitting organs and things like that? Right, and so that's where it's really important. So for me, I'm not someone who studies physiology a lot, but I have to know enough physiology to know where in the body a tag can go. And so if you um, look at dissections of sharks, for example, you can find areas in the body that have some space in them. And that's where we figure out where to put the tags. So we just know that in that area around the abdomen, that there's a, a lot of empty space that we can fit a tag in there and it's not gonna harm them. So, but that depends on what kind of species you're studying. So you have to know that kind of information. I knew we'd get a question on this because everybody, you know, is in awe and in fear of the great white shark. Mm. So have you ever done anything on the great white? I have not actually. Um, and so it would be very cool to do one day, but I've never worked somewhere where there are great whites. So um, great whites tend to live in colder waters. Um, and I have tended to work in the Bahamas and Costa Rica and other places. Um, and so I haven't, I've done work on other species that are much bigger than great whites, like whale sharks, but whale sharks eat tiny little plankton. So they're huge, but they're not as uh, menacing, if you will, as great whites. So I haven't studied them. I have lots of friends who study them um, and they're very interesting, but I just haven't done them. So. Have you um, visited the lemon shark breeding grounds? Yeah, and so that's something I should have mentioned as well. I, we, we're doing some work to try to figure out exactly where those breeding grounds were. And that's a lot of the work we did in the Bahamas. Um, and then we've had a lot of, uh, I haven't been there for these, but actually um, witnessed uh, females giving birth as well. So they have, they um, give live birth 
of the limit sharks do. And that varies a lot by species. So some species lay eggs and some species give live birth, depending on the species of shark. And so the lemon sharks give live birth and we, we do know where they breed at in the Bahamas. So um, I have been there. I have not seen them give birth, but I've, yeah, uh, it is something that, around that area. Definitely. So related, there are two questions that relate to what you just said and relate to each other. How often do you, do you collect data on sharks? And then Nate wanted to know what percentage of each section of marine biology do you spend on field, lab, and desk? Yeah, good question. So it kind of depends. So I wish I could spend like my mornings in the field and my you know afternoons in, in the, at my desk or something. But typically what happens is I might go out to the field for maybe a month a year. I might go in the summer and go um, like next summer I'll be in Madagascar for about a month or six weeks. I'm collecting the same kind of data that I talked about. And then we'll get six weeks of data and that'll kind of take us the rest of the year to process those data in the lab to do some data analysis and mathematics with that, uh, the information we collect. So it's often a, quite a small part, but it depends a lot on who you are. So some of my friends spend more like 11 months in the year in the field, and maybe one month at a desk. So it varies quite a bit. And Catalina has a question that that's similar. To, so you said you're going in the summer, um, but what time of year do you count the sharks and collect data? Is it always in the summer or does it depend on what you're researching? Yeah, it kind of depends what you're researching. So if you want to catch sharks right around the reproduction time, you probably want to go in the summer. So the lemon sharks we said to give birth in May or June. So that's often when we would go catch sharks and we could catch them when they're really young, which is a cool thing about that study. Um, but it depends. So it can be in the summer, it can be in the winter, and also it depends what part of the world you're in. And so if they're in the Northern hemisphere, like we are now, um, yeah, you might go in the summer, but seasons are reversed and this is a Southern hemisphere. So you might go in the Australian summer season, for example, but it does vary quite a bit. Definitely depends on the question. So you just mentioned Australia and Cole wants to know, are Australian sharks just sleeper sharks? Mm. So there is a, a, spe uh, a species called sleeper sharks, but there's a lot of other Australian species as well. So Australia has a ton of species of not just sharks and rays, but just marine life in general. Um, so they have a lot of different species of sharks and rays beyond just the sleeper sharks. So um, if, if that's what you're getting at, but yeah, good question. Um, let's see, Lily wants to know, how do you put chips or trackers on adult sharks? Mm. You showed the little <laughs> small shark. How do you yeah. do with the big ones? So you can see here in the picture on this last slide, there's a picture of us catching this large shark. There's about an eight foot long lemon shark. So the adult lemon sharks. And for this one, um, there's a couple different tags we can do. We can do the one where we clip that tag to their fin. That can be one good spot. Um, but if we want to do the internal tags, we can also flip them over and still cut in them, um, do a small incision and still put that tag inside them. So the same thing with that li little shark. It's actually kind of easier to do with a big shark because there's a lot more space and stuff to work with. Um, so um, same thing, a little harder to obviously you know, hold them upside down, but it still works fine to be able to put the tags inside them. Oliver wants to know, have you heard of a lava shark? Sharks that live in underwater volcanoes. Um, I've heard of sharks living near underwater volcanoes. I don't know of one called lava shark specifically, but maybe that's like a, just a term people use. Um, but what's with some of these underwater volcanoes, you can have a lot of life around them. So because sharks are top predators, where you have a lot of life for other species, you might have sharks and rays there as well. And so that wouldn't surprise me at all. But yeah, yeah, good question. Have you ever had um, trouble? Wait, I'm sorry, Cole wants to know, have you had lionfish trouble in the Caribbean? Oh yeah, so good question. So lionfish are this invasive species in the Caribbean. They're not originally from there. Um, I wish I had a picture of them, but they're this species of fish that has these um, really pointy barbs on top. And so they're not something you want to mess with too much but they're invasive in the Caribbean. That's really bad because that, what that means is that they can cause a lot of destruction um, by eating small fish, destroying the habitat. And so there's a lot of effort to get rid of them. And so a lot of places that I worked in, um, there were a lot of lionfish and a lot of programs that kind of remove those species. So just like here in Lake Champlain, they have a lot of programs about keeping invasive mussels, for example, out of the lake. 
we did the same thing with lionfish. And so we, I've caught hundreds of lionfish um, when I was working in the Caribbean, to try to get rid of them so that way they wouldn't cause as much damage. But it's definitely a huge issue that's still a problem that people are still trying to work on, but it's, it's hard to handle. Um, Brianna would like to know, do sharks have to be in deep waters? Nope. So uh, like the juvenile sharks that I worked with, they were in three feet of water, very, very shallow. If you're bigger, you have to have a little more depth because you're just physically bigger. Um, but often some sharks will specialize in really deep water um, and some sharks will specialize in shallow water. So it just depends on the species. And so related, Catalina wants to know, do most sharks tend to live in warmer waters? Yeah, so uh, most sharks tend to live in warmer waters, but that's kind of where a lot of um, other species like coral reefs and things also are, are found. Uh, but you can find things really far north and south as well. And so for instance, the Greenland sharks, they're found very far north, like in the Arctic, um, and they live in very, very cold waters. So it just depends on the species. Amber would like to know, what is a shark's closest relative? Yeah, so the, I mentioned briefly these stingrays, these kind of flat looking, um, we call them flat sharks in many ways because they're very closely related. They're basically like, you know, cousins of, of sharks. Um, and then, Next to them are the chimeras, these really um, kind of deep water fish that I, I didn't talk too much about, but they also just have cartilage. So yeah, a couple different uh, groups that all, all relate to each other. Uh, we have two related questions. Uh, one from Elliot, uh, he asks, have you ever been threatened by a shark in the water or are they just being curious? And Oliver asks, how close have you gotten to a shark in the wild? Um, yeah, so i would never, felt threatened by a shark in the water. So I have now worked with um, th thousands of sharks. So I've been in very close contact. So like in this picture, you know, holding that shark while we had it tagged, but also when we didn't have them tagged, also very close interacting with them. I mean, within a couple of feet of these, of these species. Um, and I've never felt threatened. Now that doesn't mean I don't respect these animals. I know they could do damage to me if they really wanted to. But in my thousands of interactions with sharks, I've never had any issues. I've never had any close calls, never had any bites or, or anything. Uh, it doesn't mean they can't do that, um, but I've never felt threatened that way. I respect them, I give them their space. Uh, but honestly, most times you get really close to sharks, they kind of just want to swim away um, and not want to deal with you. Like they don't have any interest in you, so. So there was another question that's related to all just, I think you just answered this, but is there any danger when working with sharks in the field? I mean, mostly you think about the biting. Are there other dangers that would, 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 uh, that you'd have to watch out for? Um, not, not really. I mean, there's like little things. So like, for example, like these sharks are very strong. So um, they have like these really strong tails, for example. And I remember once having a, I was, kind of holding the tail of the shark and it kind of whipped its tail really quickly and it whacked me in the head pretty good with its tail. Like that didn't feel very good, but it wasn't gonna you know, hurt me too bad or anything, but um, yeah. I mean, could they potentially like charge your boat and your boat could capsize? I mean, it's definitely possible. Sorry, I, have, I have the movie yeah. Jaws playing exactly. in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, our boats, like you can see in this picture, this is an eight foot shark, but our boat's much bigger than that. But also like the shark doesn't want to charge your boat and like sink it. Like it has no interest in that. It probably wants to swim away from you uh, in all honesty. Um, and so whether that's like the really small species of shark I've worked with or the much larger species, like the, I've worked with 12, 14 foot tiger sharks would probably be the biggest species, except for whale sharks. Um, but all those species I've never felt threatened or endangered or anything. Um, so we're related again to this. Rachel asked, do sharks sense people that are fearful of them in the water? Not that we know of. We don't know anything about like they can sense fear or anything like that. Um, sharks can pick up um, electrical signals using a, a kind of their sixth sense where they can pick up electrical signals. Um, and they usually use that for detecting when um, another species might be like hiding under the sand. A shark can actually find them. So it could actually detect like a heart rate, for example. Um, cause that's just producing an electrical signal from your heart. So I don't think that will detect someone who's more fearful, but it could detect that kind of signal for sure. 
So both Greta and Rachel have asked a very, almost the same question. What is your favorite shark that you've studied? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I've caught, like lemon sharks are the ones I've, I've worked with the most. And they like have a fun, you know, special place in my heart because I've worked with so many of them and so many young ones. And I've worked with ones that were just born, like their umbilical score, scar was still open, but they were so young. Um, they're very cool, but also, um, I'd have to say the hammerhead, <laughs> hammerhead sharks with their really iconic um, hammerhead. Um, I, there's something really cool about them. So I, I like hammerheads quite a bit. I, you reached out to me the day after I saw something mm. on uh, giant hammerheads mm. on during Shark Week. And I was like, yeah. I want to have a cafe on shark science. And then yeah. you reached out to me. I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. So perfect. for all of you out there, find um, Shark Week this year had a really cool a show on the, the giant hammerheads and there's research yeah. that goes on. Do, do you know more about that? I'm not yeah. explaining it well. No, that's great. I, yeah, I've, I worked with giant hammerheads as well. So they're categorized by having this really giant dorsal fin and that's um, what we might put tags on. But we worked with them a lot in Florida and the Bahamas. So um, nice. yeah, they're, they're a cool species. Well, we have two similar questions related to the megalodon shark mm, yeah. so what are your thoughts on the megalodon possibly being alive and not extinct yeah so megalodon was this um, species that was living basically during the same time as the dinosaurs um, and it's kind of like a supersized great white shark um, i don't think it still exists um, and so uh, it's a really it's a really big species i would find it really strange that if it does exist that we haven't seen one in the wild we haven't caught one or anything like that and so it would be cool if it existed. Um, I don't think it has. I think it's probably extinct. Um, people still find fossils for the, from them all the time. Um, but they're really cool species. We just don't know that much about them because they are this prehistoric species that we haven't seen um, except for fossils. Uh, again, we have two questions, very similar. How far away can a shark smell fish blood and do sharks like human blood? Um, the other question is, is it true that sharks can smell blood from a mile away? That's a good question. I don't know the exact distances they could smell blood from. I mean, they do have good senses of smell often, depending on the species. Um, and they will smell things like blood. Um, like if you, um, people talked about chumming the water earlier, that's like with fish blood and fish scents that go into the water that they can certainly smell. I don't know about differences with like fish versus human blood or anything. Um, but they can certainly smell blood. Um, and so if you put a bunch of blood, like a, a bunch of dead fish in the water, sharks will smell it and they'll come, so. How has fishing affected the shark population? Yeah, good question. The one that I talked about a little bit um, in the Bahamas, it seems, it seems like the fishing is down quite a bit, so there's not a lot of fishing. That's because that's all part of a big shark sanctuary. Well, there's not really fishing allowed in that area at least to any high degree. In other places in the world where there isn't a lot of protection, a lot of populations of sharks and rays have seen really big declines. And so I talked about the hammerhead shark. That's one of the most threatened species around the world, the, the scalloped hammerhead in particular. Um, and so people are working on trying to have conservation efforts and more protection for species like that. So it looks like Eliza is from California, sure. not far from uh, UC Davis, about 40 miles. So she wants to know what bodies of water specifically did you study um, or see sharks while you were at UC Davis? Yeah, very cool. So um, a lot of the work I was doing at UC Davis, I would still go travel to go do the work. So I would go down to Costa Rica, I would go to the Bahamas to go do some of that work. Um, but there is lots of great work you can also do in California, so in the Pacific Ocean, if you can think about like Monterey Bay um, or farther north, there's lots of species out there like leopard sharks, there's great whites out there. Um, so there's lots of cool species you can look at out there. I just wasn't really studying a lot of the ones in California, but there are lots. Nice. Um, okay, let's see. Amber wants to know, are sharks slimy? She feels like they would be. Mm. Yeah, I think that's kind of like the same feeling people have about snakes. Like you think snakes are slimy or something, but sharks actually are, extremely rough and so what's really cool about their skin to help make them fast they have this skin that is kind of like these um overlapping teeth in some ways that kind of overlap like that and so what happens is it's their skin is very smooth one way but very rough the other way 
Um, and so they're actually not slimy at all. It's just kind of smooth and then kind of rough, kind of like sandpaper actually. Um, so I've had a few unfortunate cases where I was maybe holding a shark and it maybe moved a little too much. And I got kind of this road burn from like the, the shark skin rubbing against my skin, which doesn't feel that great. Um, Lily would like to know, have you studied the basking shark? No, I wish. They're really cool. They're very similar to like the whale sharks I have studied. Um, so these really big species that eat plankton, but I haven't, I've never seen one. And I, they were super cool, but yeah, I have not studied them, unfortunately. And Catalina wonders, um, why are sharks hunted? Is it for their meat? Yeah, good question. So it depends on where you are in the world. Some people will just eat the meat, like take the shark, just like it was a, a normal fish, like a normal bony fish, and like use it for meat. Um, a big one that people use all around the world is um, actually for shark fin soup. And so often um, right. people eat the shark fin soup and they actually cut the fins off the sharks and the sharks then die and the meat actually doesn't get used, which is unfortunate. Um, and they take these fins and they export them to other places and people will eat soup that has shark fins inside them. So that's one of the biggest threats of shark fin, uh, for two shark, shark and ray species. Thankfully, that's kind of decreased a lot in many parts of the world because of this public awareness campaigns for how bad some of the populations are, but it's still an issue, definitely. Um, Cole would like to know, do you enjoy lab or field work more? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they both um, have different purposes. Um, field work is cool because I like being outside, I like being in nature, um, but the lab work is also where you can kind of process and try to understand a lot of things. So. I like doing a little bit of everything. So like the field work is where you kind of collect the data, but the lab work and the computer work is where you can kind of process that data and look at the data and actually make the scientific discoveries by looking at the data. And that's to me, one of the coolest parts. And so our final question is, I think is awesome because it's referencing the movies Sharknado. <laughs> So it says there's a bad, bad series of movies called Sharknado where sharks are lifted up by tornadoes and somehow terrorize the citizens even though they can't swim. So the question is, can sharks be lifted up by natural disasters? and Wouldn't they die in the air? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, uh, let's say, entertaining movies. Um, <laughs> so I don't see why a shark couldn't get picked up by like a tornado or hurricane or something. And there's a lot of work actually done about how natural disasters, um, like hurricanes, but also oil spills, not as, not as natural, but just as another disaster, can affect species. And so they definitely can affect species. But if they were in a tornado, I agree that it would be very hard for them to breathe because they need to be in water. So I don't think they'd make it very long, even to terrorize the whole town. So. <laughs> and Catalina just chimed in too at wondering if, if sharks can you know, breathe out of water and sounds like for a very, yeah. very short amount of time before. Yeah, exactly. They still need yeah. to be in the water, so. Well, wow, you guys, that was amazing. You just had Dr. White answer over 40 questions wow. and I hope that you all learned as much as I did. That was fascinating. Yeah, so thanks for all the great thank, questions. Yeah, that were amazing questions. Let's all thank Dr. White for his time today. And again, he um, has given his uh, Twitter handle and his website on this slide. So I would imagine if you ever uh, wanted to reach out to him, I know some of you have written in the chat that you kind of see this as potentially your future. So cool. you have someone right at UVM who um, can answer questions as you begin your pathway to college and beyond. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time, and hopefully I will see all of you next week for Living Robots. Thank you, everyone.